Good morning, everyone. Junior Church, you are dismissed. <clears throat> While they're leaving, uh, we just want to make sure you all know that um, you can follow along the sermon on the U version. Hi, Addie. Are you going to Junior Church? Okay. Yeah, hi. There, wow. Rawr. Okay, so I uh, lost my train of thought. Oh, the U version. Um, that's just adorable. I like those are my peeps. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so many jokes. So um, you can follow the sermon on the U version. You go on there and click events, and then you pick our church. And everything that's in the bulletin and on the slides, plus more, generally is in that. So please, if you want to use that, that's a free thing. Um, our Wi-Fi is up and going. So. Feel free to use the guest Wi-Fi. It is, it is up and going really well now. We humans have a lot in common with this animal, the lemming. It's a cute little furry rodent. But these furry creatures are so herd-centric that if one of them starts running, the rest follow them. And if that one runs off a cliff to its death, the herd just follows the whole herd will follow into their death. If one, fo- one wonders if they are too stupid to know that they're falling to their death, to follow a leader in front of them, it shouldn't matter that these rodents die. That's what I've read, that people are saying, hey, they deserve it. If they're following blindly a leader that's leading them to death, they deserve it. And people, we are no different in many ways to a lemming. People at the beginning of Luke 12 are literally acting like lemmings or a herd of cows or even buffalo. Buffalo, the American bison, will do the same thing. They are crowding so close to Jesus that they are trampling over each other, trying to get close to Him. The truth about lemmings is not as quite as interesting as the myth. Lemmings, which are the rat family, have such terrible eyesight they can't distinguish a small creek from a fjord, a a big um, crevice there. So it's not that they just decide to go kill themselves. The myth is if a lemming goes to kill itself, all of them join it in its death. That's not it. They're just following each other. They can't see. And this is emblematic of human tendency to our crowd mentality. I see crowd mentality all the time. I'll see it when you're coming up to a stoplight and there's two lanes and almost everybody's in one lane. And I'm like, look guys, empty lane. I'm up ahead of you now and I win. But there's, you'll see it at toll booths. Everybody starts gravitating to one or two, the crowd mentality. We do this a lot. Our blindness to our spiritual condition makes us prone to following a crowd. And when we follow the crowd, it takes us to hell. And we need to know this. If you don't believe me, then think about a moment about what was cool for you when you were younger. Think about what was cool... I don't mean temperature. I mean, what was hip, groovy, jive, or whatever it was you said back then? What were you down with? What was the bomb? See, I'm speaking some of your language there. For every generation, every decade, it seems, there are standards that develop by a group of people that sets This is what it is that we need to emulate. This is what we follow as a crowd. So what is cool to you? In 1960, it could have been this guy. James Dean, rebel. They had that greaser look, okay? Later, the next would have been this guy. The disco fever. And people wore those really ugly pants that ballooned way out at their ankles, the bell bottoms. It's like, oh, nasty. That's just my opinion because this next one, look at this big hair. That was awesome. I just saw somebody go, that rocks. That, that's the big hair in the 80s. What about the 90s was marked by the grunge? In order to be fashionable, you didn't shower. And then you wore flannel that was too big and holes in your pants like crazy. And and it just was grunge. In 2000, it brought us a thing called emo or, or Bieber cut. 
they came out of the same thing. Um, it was so cool once that I had a son who had a hairdo just like this guy, but I'm not telling you which one, not Austin. <laughs> all of these styles, all of these were loved by people. We gravitated towards them. We thought it was cool and others hated it. So think real quick out of all of those, what was cool to you? And now imagine that, and most of you are like, oh, oh, that one's good. The rest are gross. Imagine what the next trend's going to be and how we're all going to be like, that's no good. All these styles, we gravitate towards others that have the same taste. We crowd mentality into it, whether it's music, clothing, activities. It also comes with our philosophies and belief systems, even our faith. Right now, postmodernism is just really growing. It's been growing for the last 15, 20 years, but it is huge right now. It's very popular. People want something to believe in, but they don't trust the beliefs and the systems that came before them because they saw too many hypocrisies. They saw so many people living it one day and something totally different the rest of the week, and so they don't want any part of that. And the people in Jesus' days are no more immune to that tendency than we are today. But what Jesus tells everyone in every age is that he's not just some philosophy. He's not just another leader. He's not another persuasion to be discarded when a new color comes around. In Luke 12, Jesus is going to give us some very real principles that it doesn't matter your age or demographic. These are things everyone who claims faith needs to live by. So we're going to look in chapter 12 of Luke as we're going through our study of Luke of an authentic faith. We're studying Jesus, his life, and how his life is what we need to emulate. So starting in verse 1. Meanwhile, when a crowd of many thousand had gathered so that they were trampling on one another, Jesus began to speak first to his disciples, saying, Be on your guard against the yeast of Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. There is nothing concealed that will be disclosed that will not be disclosed, or hidden that will not be made known. What you said in the dark will be heard in the daylight. What you have whispered in the ear of the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roofs. We really don't like this idea that all of our secrets are going to be made known. But we need to know something. There are no secrets from God. He is going to bring everything to light that we think we can hide. Remember in chapter 11, Jesus just had a very heated discussion with the Pharisees and lawyers, and he blasted their theology of creating and placing unbearable legalistic uh, system on the people and yet not doing it themselves. This scene is still fresh in the mind of Jesus and his followers. And then Jesus points as this huge crowd is coming around him. He looks at his own personal friends, these 12 disciples, and he says, don't follow the doctrine. Don't follow those teachings. It's like yeast. It spreads. Once you ingest it, it will invade everything in your thought, your life, everything in your actions. um, It's basic legalism, pleasing God through your own efforts. You can't do it. If you remember, we talked about that. People want to prove they are good by what we do, but yet what we do in secret, what we do hidden, is contrary to what we do public. And God, Jesus, God is saying, they have to line up. What you think you do in secret and you get away with, it's not secret. Scripture tells us that that line of thinking is wrong. Look what it says, Romans, what we saw last year. As the Scriptures say, no one is righteous, not even one. If you think you are good enough by your actions, read Scripture. I'm not good enough. You're not good enough. That is legalism. Legalism, at its root, is basic selfishness. Legalism creates thinking like this. The way I look to others is more important than the way I look to God. If I look good to them, then they'll want to hear me. No. Having what I want is more important than knowing God and loving God and being like God. God would want me to be happy. Obtaining and keeping power is to to be sought no matter the cost. I need to get on top. 
I need to have control. This is what the world proclaims, not what Christians should proclaim. The Pharisees were power brokers. Uh, they were the ones who, who decided what they had to keep and how to maintain people underneath them. And Jesus is saying Pharisees might appear to be righteous. Preachers might appear to be righteous in front of the congregation, but what they do in secret is going to be brought out. No one is righteous, not one. And so all of our deeds, everything we have done is going to be brought out. Every thought or careless word I've ever spoken, will that come back to haunt me? Yes. Unless you've been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb and He's taken it away. It's going to haunt you one day. And we need to understand that. Look what Jesus goes on to say. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear Him, meaning God, who after your body has been killed has authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear Him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Every time I read this, I always make a joke. The very hairs on your head are numbered. Yeah, mine are easy to keep. But do we realize we need to fear Him? Jesus repeated it. Fear God. Not be scared of Him like He's the boogeyman but have a reverent fear that He is holy and awesome and powerful, and I am to come before Him in that manner. Don't be like the Pharisees. The Pharisees revered for being cool. They, they wanted to make sure they were hip. But it's not the worst thing. Our biggest fear as humans is generally death. Many of us fear death and the pain that's going to be involved in it. I, I, I want to die very peacefully, quiet. Uh, my ideal way to die, I'm just going to tell you in case I haven't told you, is I want to die in the pulpit and scare every one of you. <laughs> I want to say, this is what I want my last words to be. If you've never heard anything, if you've never learned, the one thing I want you to know from me is... And, and yeah, then I die. That's what I want to happen. God's not going to do it. But we, we're, I don't want a painful death. I, I don't want to cry like a little girl when I'm dying. I, I, ah. And so many of us are scared of that. But Jesus says that's not the worst thing that can happen to you. Far worse is being separated from God for all of eternity. That's something we should avoid at all cost. I don't want to be writhing in pain in hell. So I want to make sure my life match my words. We get our priorities all wrong when we become more fearful of displeasing people, of men, than our sins separating us from God, who is the true source of everything good. And yet, even Jesus says this. He also reveals the character of the person we should fear. A being so loving that He has the hairs on our head numbered. He knows us so well, nothing happens that He doesn't know. It should be wonderfully good news to us to place ourselves in His hands, unlike the Pharisees who said you need to do this, this, and this before you can come. <clears throat> and that's the problem with the world or any other worldly religion. You break your back to please them, to fit in, to do all these things, to, and you don't even get noticed. And then things get worse and you get angry and then it all breaks loose. The Pharisees didn't care about the individual, only those who held power and position. So what we see here is what you do, it matters. How should we live? Well, it matters on what you do. You cannot go around saying flippant remarks. We cannot go around and just post anything we like on social media. What we say, what we do, it matters. The Pharisees would say anything they wanted, but yet in secret they did something different. They said all the right things, but they didn't do them. And we need to make sure we are not living like the Pharisees. Look through your posts on Facebook and Instagram. If they have ungodly content, what are you saying about your own faith? 
What are you proclaiming to others? See, what you say, what you do truly matters. This phrase can be summed up with one word, integrity. Christians, it's time we start living what we say. We need to have integrity. We need to live that. What you do matters. But Jesus goes on. Look what he says, starting verse 8. I tell you, tell you, whoever publicly acknowledges me before others, the Son of Man will also acknowledge before the angels of God. But whoever disowns me before others will be disowned before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. When you are brought before synagogues, rulers, and authorities, do not worry how you will defend yourselves or what you will say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. This is a very blunt statement. Who do you belong to? This is your turn to answer. Who do you belong to? If you belong to Him, you will admit it. And Jesus says publicly. Well, they'll just know that I'm a Christian by how I live. It's not what He said. Jesus says you will publicly confirm that you are a Christian. What you do matters and what you say matters. Again, social media. I'm hitting that because it's everywhere. We need to do it. If you're not on social media, good. Wonderful. But do you have things that are posted or things that are, you have reposted that are claiming something other than God? I got called out on it. I got called on it about a month ago. I posted something that I, I reposted something that was funny. I thought this picture, it was hilarious. Really thought it was funny. So I hit repost. I did not check to see where it had come from. I was thinking it was just funny and wanted all my other friends to laugh at it. The original post came from some place that had an unchristian word in its title that I didn't even notice. A friend of Casey and I's contacted me. All she said was, did you notice where this came from? Basically, that was saying, are you proclaiming this? Are you doing this? So I thanked Susan right away for calling me out. I deleted that post. The picture was funny, but the name above it was not right. Who we proclaim truly matters. In everything we are saying, are we proclaiming God or are we proclaiming the world? Oh, it was funny, but it proclaimed the world, so I need to get rid of it. You can't do both. So give public allegiance to Jesus. That's what he's saying. But then he says, don't worry on how you're going to do it. In the moment, in the heat of this discussion, don't worry about it because at that time, the Spirit who I am placing inside you, when you proclaim me, I will come inside, I will invade inside you, and I will tell you what to say at that moment. Can you imagine the God, the creator of the universe, coming into the middle of a di heated discussion on faith, and he's saying, move over, Donnie, I've got it. Let me speak through you. And he does that in and through you. He's saying, don't worry about it, but you've got to publicly say it. Otherwise, he's got no venue to speak in and through you. If you're in a bookstore and someone sees you buy a Christian book and asks you about that Jesus stuff, the Spirit at that time is going to tell you what to say. You don't need to fret about, well, I can't buy this, I can't go there. What if somebody asks, do you trust in Him? Do you have faith that He is the God of all things? You should think about why you believe, what you believe, and why you believe it, though. First Peter says this, but in your hearts regard Christ the Lord is holy, ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is in you. Be prepared. That means you don't just come to church on Sunday. That means you study, that you read, you're praying to God. Because what you do matters. Who you proclaim matters. Let's go on verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, meaning Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus replied, this is where he gets a little 60s. Man, who appointed me a judge? 
or an arbitrator between you? Then he, Jesus, said to them, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist of the abundance of possessions. This guy came wanting justice. My brother is being unfair. How many of you have had a sibling that's unfair? All of you who've had a sibling. That's right. Jen was the only one who was unfair to herself. So this guy, he runs to God, wanting, he runs to Jesus and says, give me what's rightfully mine, you who have authority. I know who you are. You have the, he proclaimed it. He said it. Do you ever run to God after what you think where you're getting shafted, where you're not getting what's rightfully your own, only to find out the problem doesn't lie in the injustice, but the condition of your own heart. You know, I go to God, God, this isn't fair. This should happen. This should happen. And then I come away going, man, was I in a bad attitude about that? Had nothing to do with that person or that instance. It's all about my, my relationship, my attitude. Jesus here is approached by a man who wants him to side with his version of the truth in an inheritance dispute. This wasn't uncommon for rabbis. That's where they went to, to help on this dispute. But Jesus has a much more important mission, and he uses this statement as a good time to talk about the higher problem, which is greed. He who dies with the most toys still dies. That's the truth. You don't win if you got more toys. They're going to be given away to someone else. I just actually got to see a lady from another church and her husband died a year ago and they're going through all of his stuff and I'm giving it out to different things. And he told me before he died he had a dream and he woke up in a sweat, in a panic because he dreamed he died and he was watching them go through and getting rid of all of his stuff. He was so worried about the stuff in his basement and the garage. He was panicked. And you know what the people are, his family, what they want? They want him. They don't want the junk. And so they're getting rid of us because they miss him. We are so greed focused sometimes that we just want this stuff. If I could just get this, it'll make me happy. If I could just do this. God, if you give me this, because it's unfair that they have it. I'll tell you right now, I used to think people who had sports cars who are in their 40s and over were wrong. It needs to go to all the teenagers. Now I'm, a, I'm 42. It's right. I should have a sports car. What's wrong with that thinking? It's what I want. It's about greed of what I am, where I'm at. And we've fallen into that. Uh, we're going to hit this idea of greed in greater detail next Sunday. Greed is the cousin to selfishness. To explain the selfishness, Jesus tells a parable. And remember, a parable is a story or an illustration meant to teach an important point. So in verse 16, And he, meaning Jesus, told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant crop. Apparently he didn't have a ton of rain. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and then I'll store up my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. The man had more than he ever needed, but it never occurred to him to give the extra to the poor. Instead, he saw, I need to get more. I need to greed. That's what he's trying to do. I'm going to build bigger barns. I'm going to store more stuff. And it's foolish because he cannot store up all those riches for when he dies. It's not going to stop it. We are fooled into the, by the enemy into thinking that material things are what matters. Man, if I could have that new vehicle, if I could have that new house or that new addition, if I could have that wardrobe, if I could have those shoes, if I could... You're still not going to be satisfied. 
Because greed never fulfills. We're fooled. Food, property, money, big screen, HD, TVs, and the like. And Jesus is, Jesus is not saying that we should never pay attention to the material. What he is questioning is our focus. Is it okay to have nice things? Absolutely. But if they distract you from the real thing, which is a relationship with God, then they are now an idol. And you must get rid of them. Notice that this farmer in this parable... Who produced all the grain? God did in the land. I mean, we know farmers work one day a year, or two days. They plant and they harvest. That's all they do. They've got it easier than a preacher. I at least work two hours a week. Yeah. But so the, the ground produced everything. God gave him all this stuff, and he thought, now I can sit back. It's the land that produced what the farmer got, what we get are from God, what he created. We should never take the credit from what God has created. We need to rely on God. So uh, what you do matters, who you proclaim matters, and who you serve matters. In the next part of the chapter, Jesus is going to talk about relying on God for what we need, not worrying so much about things. It's okay to own a house. It's not okay if that house owns you or if you serve that house. It's okay to have money for retirement, but it's not okay if putting the money away makes you, um, away, ignore, makes you ignore the ways of becoming rich towards God. You need to be able to take care of your family, yourself, absolutely. But if that comes in the way of God, you must get rid of it. The question we need to ask yourselves then is, who do you serve? Is it God or is it the stuff? I used to work at an auction house. And uh, we'd go in and do clean-outs of houses. And all these people's things. And it was so sad that they put all their time and energy into this stuff. And you know what the families are always saying? I miss Grandma. Wish I had more time with Grandpa. Man, I'd love to just sit down with Dad once more. I didn't want the stuff. You are not the stuff that you collect. You're not. You are created in the image of God. And we need to live that. Who we serve, is it stuff or is it God? Don't let anything own you other than God. The person who serves God is not greedy, but generous. We see this lived out in the church of giving of uh, free will offerings numerous times. We have seen it here in this church when we've said, hey, we need this, this is coming, we need money, and then you flood the offering with it. People who follow God are generous. They serve Him, not their bank accounts. Paul has some good advice about the rich for all of us. 1 Timothy 6, instruct those who are rich in the present age not to be arrogant, or to set their hope in the uncertainty of wealth, but on God who richly provides us with all things to enjoy. So it's okay to be rich. It's okay. As long as that's not your goal or God. Instruct them to do what is good, to be rich in good works, to be generous, willing to share, storing up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the coming age, so so they may take hold of what is truly life. So don't, don't hear that to be a good Christian, you've got to be poor. That's just how I choose to do it. <laughs> Trying to get some nice stuff or better stuff is fine. It really is, as long as it doesn't become your God or hinder your relationship. Let me reiterate this. The values of this lesson that Jesus is saying is, what you do matters. What you do in front of people and what you do in secret matters because God is going to bring them all up to light. And if your doings there don't line up with God's faith, with His standard, then you need to change it. He's the only one who's going to be able to lift that up. You're the one who can change it. So what, uh, what you do matters. You are to live with integrity. Don't be a lemming. Don't follow the crowd. Well, this is the new way of thinking. I don't really care. 
follow life, which is God. Don't go with what's cool. I would love for us all to go to the big hair bands. I think they were cool in my day. Those who are a little younger are like, that's gross. But you know what never goes out of style is living a godly life in Him. The world will say it's out of style, but God says this is true life. And if you do this, it will always be in fashion in heaven because Jesus said, I will proclaim you in front of all of them. I will say, this is my guy. This is my girl. And don't you want that rather than somebody saying, oh, look how cute you are. It's what God says about us. So who you, who you serve, who you proclaim, we need to understand this because the world is watching. They want to know if what we do, what we say, and who we serve really matters. So this weekend, we get this chance where we get to remember a lot of things of sacrifices that have happened in this country. And it's a great thing to do tomorrow and do that. But every day of our life, we have a chance to remember, to honor a sacrifice that was given so that I can actually live, not on this planet, but in heaven. And shouldn't my words, shouldn't my actions, shouldn't my service all reflect that? The world wants to know. So are you willing to do that? Are you willing to say, I will be that living memorial for what Jesus did on the cross? We're going to stand and sing. And if you're ready to make that decision, won't you do it? Won't you come forward and make that proclamation of who Jesus is to you?